today we will follow the order of um, the, the poster order um, for each panelist to share um, around 10 minute talk. And then we'll have around 20 to to open up for discussion. Uh, and if you are one of the audience, we would also welcome you to um, post your questions either in Q&A or uh, directly in the chat box. And before we start, we just want to uh, announce our next webinar. Um, so these two webinars are both uh, set on the topic of community engagement learning. And our next one would be in Mandarin. And that will take place on July the 3rd, which is a Friday, and it's 9 to 10 p.m. Beijing time. So if uh, you're listening and you are one of the Mandarin speaker, uh, or you can understand Mandarin, you're welcome to join us. Uh, in around three weeks time. So we're recording this webinar and before we start, we will play a very short video to introduce our webinar. We host meetups to connect creative and innovative practitioners to share their creative designs, expressions, and practices. Since 2018, we have hosted six meetups during which we explored the future of creative learning, talked about modern curriculum design of traditional Chinese music, and even put together a storytelling concert featuring the music, lyrics, and script created by children. We invited case presenters to share experiences around creative learning in Chinese rural communities, and children and parents to share creative learning at home, and educators and designers to discuss design thinking in and beyond higher education. Hi, I'm Alex Ruthman, a professor at NYU Shanghai in the program on Creativity and Innovation. Hi, I'm Ye Yue, I'm an assistant professor at the program on Creativity and Innovation at NYU Shanghai. Together, we founded and currently lead the CXZ Lab, or Creative Experience Design Lab. We are inviting you to our Creative Meetup webinar series on Creative Teaching and Learning Online. Welcome. Welcome. And you will find more details on this website link. And also we've put together all the recordings of all the previous webinars uh, on this YouTube channel. And we are also currently editing uh, and subtitling in Chinese. And we'll upload that in Billy Billy uh, later on. So you can um, keep uh, updated and review that. Um, Alex, do you have anything to add before we start? I'm just really happy to have everybody here uh, and to be able to share uh, perspectives uh, focused on um, what it's been like for community organizations and their perspectives, uh, not just uh, during this time of COVID-19, but also in the US uh, in the time of uh, Black Lives Matter coming back and being right at the forefront. Uh, and so we're, we're absolutely thrilled to have uh, our panelists to share the perspectives about how their organizations are adapting, changing, serving their, um, serving their uh, constituents and learners in this time. So uh, we're happy to um, begin the webinar. Welcome. So now we will um, hand over to Flora Wang, who is the co-founder of Go Beyond. And she will be sharing a recent project called a Wikipedia of Social Innovation. So I hand over to you, Flora. Okay. Uh, so good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me here, Yin Yuan and Alex. So today I will share with you a recent project of ours, and it's called a Wikipedia of Social Innovation. Yeah, it sounds very ambitious. And so it also has its own name. It's called CoLife. You can see this little like yellowish um, logo here. Okay, yeah, this is the one. So before that, I'll briefly walk you through a little bit background about myself and also about the social enterprise I co-founded. So this is about me. So when I was writing this, thinking like how I should introduce myself. And I kind of reflect on what has changed after I become a social entre entrepreneur. So these are the three things I, I guess I can share here. So these are the changes I think I went through. 
So the first thing is I am a social entrepreneur right now. And before that, I actually worked at a nonprofit organization in China. It is one of the biggest and we support social entrepreneurs. So my job is to support social entrepreneurs and now I become one. So it's a very interesting transition. The second thing is um, I really like creating things, just have a lot of ideas. And I used to like, like create by myself and gradually I think I become more like inclined to be a co-creator. So I creating a network of other co-creators. So CoLive is also one of the projects where we co-create with many amazing uh, contributors. The third thing is about empowering others. So I have a background in education and through my career, I kind of have some uh, career in education and also like supporting uh, social entrepreneurs. And I think I gradually kind of grow into this belief in empowering. Yeah, so this is a very brief background about myself. And so this is about the social enterprise we co-founded. Yeah, so I co-founded it with my partner. And if you guys can read the Chinese, it's actually very interesting because um, the, our name is kind of um, adapted from a Chinese phrase. So the original Chinese phrase uh, reads, nothing is too strange, yes. And we kind of adapt the last uh, character into this character. It means travel, yeah. So it is what we do. And I think this new name, this our name, it means we go with the off the beaten path. And I really like that because I think this is what we do. And what is the off the beaten path we choose is we would like to explore the world through the vision of a social innovator. That is where I think we stand out and that is what we believe. We're really like interested in creating a variety of experiential learning experience. So I was talking about uh, the social enterprise, yes. So that is what we are and I think I will go just directly into CoLive, the thing I'm gonna share with you guys today. So um, we were phrasing it as the Wikipedia of social innovation and we call it CoLive. And it sounds very ambitious, but I'll be honest, like at the very beginning, it's just very small and we never thought about it becoming like something like a Wikipedia. So when was it started? It was started in early February and it was maybe the, the third week into the quarantine and I was really enjoying myself like at the beginning of the quarantine because it's the spring break, spring festival. And I was able to catch up with all the TV shows and every entertainment I always wanna do. But I kind of get bored because there's too much time and there's nowhere to go. And I was thinking what I'm gonna do, like what should I do? And then I opened my computer and I saw millions, not millions, but many like folders on my desktop because I like to collect like reports, articles. I always think I have the time to read them and they were just there and that's the end of the story. And I look at them, I think it's time to clean, like get them sorted. And at that time, I was introduced by my friend to a um, collaborative team, team collaboration tool. It's called Notion. I guess some of you guys know about Notion. So I think, yeah, I have Notion and I want to try it. And I want to do a personal, kind of a personal database. So I just started this idea and this project as a personal library. And I then shared this idea with some of my friends and saying, do you wanna do this together? Because we can have a workspace and share with each other. 
I think it's a great idea. And my friend said, yeah, why not? So we started as like a group of three and then gradually growing into a group of 10 over, over a month. So at that time we were thinking it's like, it's something a lot of people like kind of say, yeah, that's exactly what I wanna, wanna do. And that's something I really wanna see. So we were like kind of, when we talk to people, like share with people this idea, we were like more and more getting into why we want to do this and where we want to go. So this, the name CoLive and also like the vision of it just comes out of that. So what is CoLive? As I said, it's more like a Wikipedia of social innovation. And what is special about that? I think what is special about it is the word co. <laughs> so when we say collab, we say we mean like collaborative library. But I also think co stands for many other things. Collaboration, co-creating, community, connect, and maybe cool. Yeah, it's a really cool library. And I think every one of our contributors is very cool. And yeah, I think the most special thing about Colab is it's a community where everyone is a reader and also a contributor, just like Wikipedia. And so why do we create it? As you have already heard my story. So I think the textbook answer is to empower people use the power of knowledge. But my answer is it's a freestyle thing. So right now, like after this is maybe four months, we will also, we will always say that CoLive is just like an ocean of knowledge. Uh, in Chinese, we say ocean of knowledge all the time. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever seen an ocean of knowledge. Me neither. But if there is an ocean of knowledge, I think CoLive could be something like that. So in an ocean, we welcome any style of kind of exploring this ocean of maybe just playing like in the way you like. You can swim, you can dive, you can paddle. So that, that is what I mean by freestyle. And it is definitely a community created by anyone, everyone and for everyone to use. And so without any further ado, we'll go to CoLive. So this is it, uh, I can use this one, yeah. This is CoLive. As you can see, it's created with Notion. And I'll just walk you guys through how, what, is, what it is look like. So this is the front page and you will see this is like a comment box. People leave comments here. And we make it like, a, I guess, like a website. So here we have, a, we have the topic we recommend most. It's seasonal. So right now it's a resilience community. And here we have 10 different, this is called the topic plaza, I guess, topic plaza, yes. So we have 10 topic plaza. Like this one is city and rural area issues. And under this topic plaza, we have different topics, uh, sustainable cities, community development, Every topic is a social, social issue, to, social topic. Yeah. And after the plaza, we have a toolbox. Yeah, we call it toolbox. So here we have uh, all the tools you may need or you may want to do your own social innovation projects. So we have uh, design thinking and some other design tools, social design, etc. And here we have a special column. It's, the, it's about how you can explore the city uh, in a very different way. And these are some of the magazines we put here, the link. I think everyone knows Stanford Social Innovation Review, the big issue. And there is a, a Taipei like magazine. And these are the other important information. So I, would, I have just opened uh, a page, this one, Resilient Community, so we can see what is inside. Let's go to the very top. So 
uh, each page is slightly different in terms of the style, uh, but we all have the very similar, like the, I think the framework, yeah. It's about like, what is resilient community? Like why it is important, uh, what is it like? So every, like here, the information, I think it's just like Wikipedia. So you go through this page and you will see uh, all the information. This is the case uh, about resilient community. We collected Taiwan, the United States, the United Kingdom, like different uh, case, case studies here. So it's like a database. So you go through this page and I think you can get a hand of uh, resilience community, this topic with all the reading materials, with all the reports, etc. Yeah. And also something maybe a little bit uh, more uh, different or special uh, in comparison to Wikipedia is that we have something uh, very special here so like uh, this page creator she put her like reading notes here and she she studies uh, in japan so it's in japanese um like she is reading a book about resilience community and she put it here and yeah this is her like class note course note and this is something we do uh along with the co-life. This is uh, like an online learning camp we do. And out of the camp, we have some like, these are uh, their like projects. Yeah, they put their projects here. So this column is very special. We hope each of the page, we can have a special column. It is something we create. And other than that, we have the information necessary for people to understand this topic. So this is something we kind of talk about and reflect on. It's like life is short, but we think it is also wide. So we are not going far lately because we usually travel a lot, but it helps us to reflect that I think we think there's a way to go wide. That is to connect with the crazy ones, the ones who we share our value with and we can create some impact together. And by crazy ones, we are thinking about something uh, Steve Jobs said, those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world, you really do. So these are the people we work with and I feel really pleased and very flattered and honored to work with all of our uh, contributors and all the crazy like social innovators. So this is um, our story about uh, CoLab. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flora. Switch back to my screen. So uh, thank you for sharing the story and you set the town um, that is really related to today's topic, it's the term co-creation. And I guess uh, many of us can echo that during a quarantine time, our physical world um, really is um, shrunken, um, but our, I would say spiritual world may have expanded uh, with a lot of new creative ideas. So uh, next, we will have our second speaker, uh, Lei, uh, Joe Lei from Oriental Genealogy Institute. Uh, it's extremely hard to describe what it is, um, but so I will not try to do that. Um, if I can use a closer word to describe and label it, I would say maybe a, a think tank because they are not only doing uh, a lot of learning projects uh, and social innovation projects, um, but during that, um, Lei has been constantly thinking and reflecting and sharing all the process. Um, so I hand over to you, Lei, to share um, your topic today. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to just uh, share what what we've been doing uh, ever since the COVID-19. Uh, I'm trained as an anthropologist. So um, most of the time, I think my way of doing things together with my colleague is by 
by using a method is AA method, which is analytical autoethnography. So when I do design work, I always involve my colleagues to do field work together and constant reflecting what do you actually need, what you have seen and what you want to contribute. So always put yourself in the uh, big picture before you do any um, meaningful dialogues or contribution to others, constantly talk about, talk, uh, keep uh, asking questions and try to answer questions by yourself. So I, I will give you uh, one or two examples as, um, as a starter. Uh, very recently, one of my good friends in Shanghai is actually American. Um, his father died from COVID-19. And his mother also infected by this disease. And most importantly, um, he's a single child. So incredibly difficult situation for him. Um, and now he lives in Shanghai with, um, with his wife and two kids. So it's a really a dilemma for him. But finally, in, in the end, he decided to fly back to, to see her mom. But that is a huge decision for him because that, that means he have no idea how can, how can he get back to join his family here in China. So um, when I live in Shanghai, I, can't, I constantly um, encounter, encounter something like this on a day-to-day -day basis. So when I do design work and also do the media campaign things and also do education. I know uh, this disease has transformed our society in a really um, traumatic way. So I tend to use more of my, um, my methods and also constantly chewing over my own experience to share with others. Um, and when we design community uh, project like uh, this example. This is one example. Uh, this is actually a journal. But when I finish one uh, community design, I might just walk off with, um, with all the money, but I often do many redundant things, superfluous things that my colleagues always complaining, Jolie, why you keep doing something uh, others do not expect from you. Mm, the reason why I'm doing this is because I, I don't want something designed um, just uh, as a product and they just rip it up the essence and they throw away many very good designs uh, away like rubbish. So this brochure uh, is actually monthly. Most of the writing contents is added by myself together with one or two designers and I send it to the community members for free just to share the situation about the, um, about the, uh, the, the disease. Also to share some insights, what's going on around the world in terms of community design, lifestyle. And just last week, I, I uh, encouraged my colleague to, to do a one, one seminar. It's more like a workshop with a group of elderly people um, by doing one dessert together. The dessert is an Italian dessert. Uh, it's called tilamisu. And, um, but I Twittered the name of to alamisu, because in Chinese, ala, uh, actually in Chinese, ala means um, me. It's like my misu. So I designed this kind of a dessert together with my colleague. I have one conception. I, I'm trying to convince my uh, begin, beginning uh, by convincing my colleague. Actually, you can do something together, like dessert together with your with your family members, even with your friends. So you can use in different layers of food, and and you share the food together. So each one of them, when they dip, put the spoon inside the scoop, it. It's like a shared story. Oh, this one, this one layer, this layer reminds me my childhood. 
uh, maybe uh, an elderly person use another spoon, dig in the middle layer and say, oh, that, that reminds me when I was uh, 18 um, and I, have, uh, I, I buy this dessert to share with my girlfriend. So it, it's, it's really kind of um, uh, conversation-based food. So that's why I call it tiramisu. And I know when I designed this um, uh, food project for the community, what I'm trying to contribute is to bring some conversation, very variable conversation back to community life. Because if you uh, have a chance to live in Shanghai, very easily uh, you'd be um, mind boggled by the, um, by the uh, fast pace um, in Shanghai communities. People, sometimes they, they don't care about each other. They, they always live in the, uh, their own bubbles. And it's not just because of COVID-19. Before COVID-19, many people live inside their uh, bubbles and their cocoons. And uh, even though Shanghai is such a cosmopolitan city, but uh, travel in Shanghai is like travel in different countries. The, north, the northern part of uh, Shanghai can be drastically different to the southern part of Shanghai. It's like travel, uh, you travel two or three blocks, it's like you, you visit Paris first, and then you visit uh, Brasilia, and then you visit Chile. Uh, it's, it's really strange um, if you really can put themselves together. So when I say transgeneration design, I always trying to um, cultivate a sense of human centered based on each individual story, based on each individual's reflection of their own life and uh, to cultivate what we call as a lead culture. Because when we design center for older people, older people always say, I don't make it too colorful. I don't want to live in like a kindergarten kind of place. Uh, but what we're trying to convince them is um, you maybe not should be, uh, you should not be too selfish because many, um, many kids, uh, they have to stay with older people because they, they, their parents have to work. So, uh, Maybe you can share some of your space together with your, with your uh, grandson or grand, granddaughter or some other people's uh, grandson, granddaughter. Because when they play together, when, when the older people hang together, they can keep an eye on uh, kids. So uh, that's make the transgeneration design possible. Um, another example I would like to give you is, is one book like this. Uh, this is book. This book is uh, I, I did together with my daughter, but the story is collected from Brazil. When I do, when I did my uh, field work in Brazil, by following the GMO soybean plantation project, the story is narrated by a local uh, Shavanti old people. Uh, is a spot a star and start transfigurizing into a lady, and the, the boy trying to rescue this lady. I put the lady back into the forest to find a tree, patting the tree, the tree grown forever in the sky and then send the, the, the lady back into the star. It's just beautiful adolescent story. So I, I asked my Portuguese friend to translate it first into English, then I translate it into Chinese. And I rewrite it by using many traditional Chinese literature to make it more Chinese-like. And I work together with my daughter. My daughter paint half of it and I paint, an, I paint another half and I turn it into a book. And I constantly use this story to uh, share in the Transgeneration uh, Community Center I, I've been doing. For the past four years, we finished 42 centers for older people. I, I always design this kind of uh, originative story to share with them. I just, in, just trying to encourage them. Uh, you may never have a chance or have a curiosity to visit uh, Brazil, those uh, Shavani people, Shavani, Shavani village but you are, you are encountering Brazil on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, from last year, we imported at least 10, um, 10 million, uh, 100 million, 100 million GMO soybeans from, from Brazil. That's a huge number. And I, I've seen with my own eyes how the GMO soybeans have wreaking environmental havoc. So when I design the transgeneration center, it's not just a, 
design one center and uh, make it more comfortable for you to play cards, play mahjong together. This is a center for you to broadening your horizon. So I'm gonna bring all kinds of people, all kinds of activity curriculum. Even some of the projects not funded, like the, like this project. No one's funded this, but I'm doing something not because I can get money from. It. Definitely, I need to get money to to keep the ball ro rolling. But uh, when I finish the um, the the uh, uh, basic requirement, I started thinking what is actually make our center, the Oriental Technology Center, uh, different uh, from others. Because we, we, we call ourselves non-profit, we call ourselves think tank, but you know in China it's very difficult to register your, your organization as a think tank or as a NGO, a really NGO. It's almost impossible because, because of legal issue, because of the uh, uh, different, uh, very complicated political issues. Uh, it's almost impossible to run a pure NGO. So you have to be smart. You have, you have to constantly over exploit, uh, exploiting your, yourself um, if you don't want to exploit others. Um, and of course, I don't want to exploit those older people. And because for one thing, they don't have money, um, but they, they have so many good stories to tell, like just like the very, very poor and very, very, um, uh, 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 this disenfranchised or dispossessed uh, group of people living in the middle of nowhere in a Sh in a Shavanti village. I know how they suffer. So I want to do something to to link them together, to to make them um, to have open open heart to see each other like on equal footing. So I guess uh, that's something make of uh, organization organization. Uh, special, a little bit different from others. Uh, I think that's, that's all I want to share. Uh, I'll, wrap, I'll wrap up here. And uh, if you have any other questions, I will be happy to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, so I hope you will not self-exploiting <laughs> too much. Um, and I hope occasions like this um, will be some of the tiny effort that we make uh, to build potential collaborations and to seek further opportunities so we can all be connected. Um, but I definitely heard um, a lot of care and share in your talk. Uh, and what is interesting is that piece of dessert as a collaborative effort. Um, this alamisu and it reminds me of how one of um one of the authors said with a lot of things we create uh we bring something into existence into its form but with food um it's its significance or its meaning lies in we consume it um, but with that particular dessert it's collective consumption but um we create stories, we consume the food, the food disappears, and then we create new stories during that process. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so now I will hand over to Alex to introduce our next speaker. Yes, and uh, welcome. Um, and I think that's a great transition. Uh, the common theme across all of these is this personal process of making. And so I'm uh, we're, we're thrilled to have James here uh, share a bit about uh, his organization's Arts Corps in Seattle and about uh, making art anyway. So welcome, James. Thank you. How are you? Uh, good morning. And thank you, uh, Flora and, and Lei, for your presentation. That was, that was, that was lovely. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see. Uh, as Alex says, uh, I'm James Miles. I'm the executive director of Arts Corps. Uh, we're based in Seattle, Washington, in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Uh, and here's our mission, which is to revolutionize arts education by igniting the creative power of young people through culturally engaging learning experiences. Uh, we work towards a world where barriers to arts education no longer exist, and all young people can creatively lead the transformation of schools, neighborhoods, and beyond. Most important to us is creativity, equity, and collaboration. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. Actually, this is our 20th year anniversary. Um, 
and we've been you know focusing in mostly after school for about 10 years so that's uh, as we call ost programming um, but recently in about 2012 we started doing creative schools so these are our programs creative schools is integrating visual art uh, dance theater into a math science english class ost is after school pre-professional learning in the arts we also do this at these uh, sites we call art spaces, and that is low income residential housing facilities um, that are located in different parts of the city. Uh, and sometimes those art spaces also include juvenile detention sites. Um, speaking of, of young people, Youth Speak Seattle is our youth run poetry writing circles and poetry slams. Poetry slam is basically a poet slams up. We may have seen it on, t on TV or, or in the theater uh, and they speak their poetry aloud, generally to some kind of rhythm. Um, our Arts Liberation and Leadership Institute, uh, AKA Ali, is a two week intensive. We're studying uh, social justice, organizing uh, and artistry. And previously it's been different tracks. We've done break dancing, we've done music, we've done visual arts, we've done filmmaking, we've done poetry. This year we're adding another element, which is our Learning Immersive Technology Program, or, or LIT, as is the young uh, people in, in the US say quite often, it's LIT, which is mixed media mentorship for 16 and 19 year olds. And that program teaches virtual reality, augmented reality, filmmaking and game design. Uh, in fact, the young people just had a showcase last night that went swimmingly, it was, it was beautiful. And then the last thing we do uh, is professional development, which is training teachers, school administrators, staff, and anyone interested in growing their race and social justice practices, and of course their teaching uh, practices. Um, so we were going to have our largest fundraiser of the year uh, for Arts Corps, where we generally raise uh, almost half a million dollars, uh, half a million U.S. dollars, and then we had. Uh, Court, you know, school, uh, I should say stay at home regulations. So this happened Monday, schools ended the, the Friday before, and we had to organize an event that was no longer in person with 400, 500 people, but online. So I'm gonna play a little excerpt about what we did the day before we had this, uh, the quarantine happened. Um, and this is just a... Uh, we did this from our offices in Seattle. Uh, these are some of our teaching artists. Laura Runga is a trumpeteer. Uh, Aaron Walker Loud is uh, uh, our drummer. Erica Merritt is on vocals. Brian is on keyboards. And DJ Topspin is on the one and twos, as we say. So we pivoted pretty quickly to do justice. I'll let you listen for a while. I'm sure we can listen to this. Uh, for me, this is 7 in the morning. This is a great wake-up song. But I'll, I'll continue to what else we were doing. Um, so, you know, the majority of our work happens at school sites and school buildings. So we had to figure out a way to reach the 3,000 plus students in South Seattle, which are mostly low income, mostly black and brown students, in ways that we've never done in the past. <clears throat> so we're watching live without uh, sound is our teaching artist, Samaya. She's teaching djembe drumming which is a West African drum. Um, and we've posted about 15 videos online uh, showcasing different art forms. We've also delivered art kits. I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, in the top right corner, you will see our a screenshot of our Instagram lives. We've been doing Instagram live quite a, quite a lot, uh, just showcasing the artistry of the teaching artists and uh, you know, trying to bring some light and joy to young kids and young families' lives. Um, and then of course we have a coloring book that was designed by one of our teaching artists, Maria, uh, to reflect what we're in, but to add some color in your life. So I wanna talk about these art kits. We made these art kits um, 
for one particular reason. The majority of the young people that we work with uh, have no access or limited access to technology and Wi-Fi. So when schools shut down, they're much disregarded by society. There's no way to teach them, no way to reach them. Um, so we wanted to bring some, some one creativity to their lives. So we dropped off 1300 art kits uh, in the Highline School District, which is just south of Seattle. Uh, and we'll, de we'll deliver more at sites where free meals are delivered. So because schools were closed <clears throat> and quite a few of your young people depended on those schools for their, their meals, breakfast and lunch, <clears throat> pardon me, we um, were able to coordinate with the school district to say, when you drop off these free meals, we will also drop off these art kids with directions to how they can get free Wi-Fi uh, in many different languages, activities, and uh, arts-based curricula. Uh, so I, I mentioned the 15 arts videos we've made. We've done coloring books that can be downloaded and colored. Uh, those were also dropped off at the different art spaces. Uh, online art space activities, so teaching STEAM using paper, uh, STEAM concepts using paper and, and triangles and, and uh, paper triangles, uh, and then building that with into a pyramid of sorts. Um, online classes resumed immediately, uh, especially our learning immersive technology classes, which is digital media class. That happens every Tuesday and Thursday. So we're working with high school students from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We took over their school day for, for you know, since March through yesterday uh, and just taught them uh, mixed media skills. Uh, our poetry program also immediately transitioned to be online uh, and, you know, having uh, poetry events, writing circles where young people gather together to bounce ideas off each other, uh, to write a poem. Uh, that happened pretty quickly. And then at the 30 plus sites that we teach in, in the schools, we also did live teaching uh, using either integrating art into the classroom or as enrichment. And of course, we've created lesson plans for teachers to use, uh, especially those teachers that did not have a facility uh, teaching online or trying to engage young people through in, in academia. Uh, and that's, that's one of our skills, engaging young people using the arts into academic concepts. And of course, these, these lesson plans we've designed uh, serve as the arts credit, which students need from high school to graduate. Uh, and as a nonprofit uh, NGO, we are the art credit for several schools, mostly alternative high schools. Uh, I would say 75% of the alternative high schools in Seattle, we serve and are their arts credits. Throughout all of this, um, we paid our teaching artists and have never stopped paying our teaching artists throughout this entire fiscal year. Uh, that was huge for us because the teaching artists and the you know, gig workers, as, as we say, do the work and they're, they're the heart of the work that we do. You know, as an administrator, you know, I just press buttons and click things, uh, but it's, it's the, the young, the, not the young, the teacher artists that deliver the content and are the heart of the work we do. So the question is, what are we gonna do now, right? We're into the fiscal year, school's out starting next Friday. What are we going to do? Um, so we came up with some ideas. Uh, our creative schools, which is our arts, integra arts integration program, uh, it's, we call our, also our, lear our lab program, which is standing for learning, arts and belonging, still will be at these uh, three elementary schools in South Seattle, uh, and that's combining art during the school day, integrating art into academic classrooms, in addition to family workshops in the, in the, in the evenings and the afternoons. Uh, and we'll be doing all of this online. Uh, we will continue to deliver art kits. Uh, we found that to be wildly successful. Uh, several news outlets in Seattle have reached out and done pieces on our, our art kits because we are one of the only people working with young people that don't have access to internet and technology. Uh, we will continue to work with our alternative high school that are, that are called interagencies, providing curriculum, uh, career exploratory learning, and the credits they need to graduate. Our professional development has actually increased dramatically. We're doing more and more workshops for not just Seattle Public Schools and the Highland Public Schools, which is close to us, but also other districts and other regions of the United States who really are trying to engage in like, how do you teach young people at a time where they don't want to engage. Uh, 
I know in the U.S., the the online engagement for 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 students has been uh, about forty eight percent. So more than you know, uh, more than half of the students are not interacting with their classroom teachers or, or fellow students and are missing several months of schooling. Um, our teen leadership programs, which were you know to connect young people to careers in, in colleges, we are reimagining them to be more efficient and stronger. In light of current events and you know the developmental needs of of teens, uh, we're trying to think maybe this teen leadership program is also more of a mental health, social emotional learning program because that's what we find teens need the most uh, is some camaraderie, which is very hard in quarantine as we as we all know around the world. Um, our summer institute, arts leader arts liberation and leadership institute, will be postponed to fall of 2020. Uh, so that we can plan for virtual workshops that will be engaging to youth. Um, all of this is happening and we're investing in strategic planning uh, to further align our mission and work. Uh, we know we had to adapt pretty quickly. We want to make sure we're adapting in the right way, meeting the needs of the community, meeting the needs of the artists that we work with, and meeting the needs of, of the schools and school districts that are, that are in our purview. Uh, and last, not, last but not least, we're advocating for policy change. Um, this is really big, you know, every, it's, it's no surprise to anyone in the world that, that the U.S. education system uh, is an old education system founded by Horace Mann in the 1800s, uh, really made to, to create assembly line, assembly line workers. Uh, that form of education still exists in, in schools today uh, and predominantly for public schools, and those public schools are mostly filled with black and brown youth, mostly low income youth. Uh, and those, it's a school to prison pipeline. We are adamant about redirecting that pipeline so that young people do not go from, from house to school to prison based on their economics or their, the color of their skin or their religion or their uh, uh, you know, citizen, citizenship status. We want them to offer them many more opportunities. Uh, what's happening with Black Lives Matter has really elevated this. Um, we, there's a moratorium, so on police in schools. Um, police have always been in schools, not always, but police have been in schools for a long time in the United States for several decades, uh, mostly as surveillance and quite often used as a uh, force to get young people to quote unquote toe the line and do what they're supposed to do. Uh, to be automatons, so to speak. And we're trying to, to navigate that because we val value what young people are thinking, what they want. They're not empty vessels. They already come with a, a breadth of knowledge. And it's up to us as educators to use that knowledge to further them in their lives and careers. Um, and that's what schools need to be. It needs to be less of a daycare and less of a, a, a way to say, like, learn this so you can, you know, make license plates in, in prisons or work for McDonald's and make, you know, cups in prison. It's more like uh, school should be for youth uh, and to uplift, engage, you, unite, uh, and excite. Um, so that, that's a lot of the work we're doing in terms of educational policy shift uh, and speaking with our capital here in, in, in Washington State, which is Olympia, and then going and bringing that work we're doing here in Washington State to uh, the capital of the United States, D.C., to really change educational policy. Um, yeah, it, that's about it for me. Thank you. This has been a really fun. And thanks, Alex and, and Young Wee for in, inviting me. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to, to you all. Thank you, James, for, for sharing the work that you and your organization are doing, and particularly um, the efforts that you've done to keep the needs of your students front and center. and and something that doesn't get said enough is that you really have put your teaching artists um, yes. front and center and, you know, continuing to invest in them and their careers and their life um, is, is so important at this where it's easy for an organization to trim. You yeah. It's hard to preserve and keep that, um, those core people there going, uh, they're your interface. And, and thank you very much for sharing all of the very practical um, strategies and, and things that your organization has done to, to keep things going and while looking inward and transforming and, and shifting for the future. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your model with us. Thank you, thank you.
And uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our final panelist for the evening, uh, John Morgan Bush from the Juilliard School uh, at New York City, where he's been um, fairly recently uh, working as the uh, Director of Lifelong Learning. So we're very interested to hear how um, your, your position has um, come into uh, the forefront uh, at Juilliard and how you've all been adapting during this time. So welcome, John Morgan. Great, Alex. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks to uh, to Flora and and Leigh and and James uh, and everyone who's spoken this morning. I, I I'm so um, I, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad to hear all these wonderful ideas coming from everyone and literally all over the globe. Um, in my neck of the woods, I'm at the Juilliard School. Uh, I'm, my uh, title is Director of Lifelong Learning, and what I do there is head the Juilliard Evening Division. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what that is, and then we'll go into some of the impacts we've been facing uh, in, the rec in recent months. So let me just share my screen here. Uh, so sort of the idea um, that I've been uh, thinking through the past since really March 9th is the date for me. Everybody has their own date for when the global pandemic began to really affect them. And so, so uh, the early March is when it really began for us. So um, thinking through uh, what we want to talk about today. So just to kind of a map of what we'll talk about, I'll give you an overview of the evening division and then our transition to online instruction. And really now we've had a little bit of distance from when that began so we're beginning to think about the opportunities and decisions we have to make for the future and i think since i'm the last uh, presenter today we'll go into a group discussion after that so what is the juilliard evening division um it's about 90 years old and basically what we do in the evening division is we offer a wide array of courses uh, taught by faculty from juilliard in dance music and drama and these, these courses, um, they can be one day intensive or year long. They can be um, lectures, they can be performance-based courses and piano, voice, violin. And basically it's continuing education uh, for the Juilliard School. And uh, it's a well-established um, sort of foundational component of continuing education in both New York City uh, and as at part of Juilliard. And then what happened, um, in the recent months has really changed the fundamental nature of what we do. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. That would be to give you an idea of the scope of who we serve. There's here's a, a snapshot of Juilliard evening division by the numbers. So um, you can see we've had uh, around between 700 and 650 or so students this year at various points, um, running about 88 courses a uh, semester, uh, over 30 in the summer. But the key thing that will impact the rest of what I want to share today um, is that over 60% of the Juilliard Evening Division students are over the age of 65 years old. And so you'll hear me um, echoing some of what Leigh was saying earlier about the aging population. So we, we definitely serve an aging population. <clears throat> and the pandemic, uh, as it came and really impacted the entire world, had very different and special implications for seniors. So um, when we, when things were beginning to shut down, we had to make some decisions and I thought it'd be valuable for everyone in the group today to think sort of through the, to illustrate the framework of the decision-making process that we had um, back in March. And because I think it, is not just as a response to the coronavirus. I think it actually turned out to be a pretty good um, model to think about change in organizations uh, and creative experiences and making and new ways to present and uh, meet challenges. So um, we have this sort of framework. It's called Challenges to Online Learning Design, um, but it's really multifaceted and can be applied to a lot of situations. So the first I think of it as a pinwheel. Um, and so the first sort of piece of the pinwheel over here is to assess the competing imperatives. So it's March, we have, you know, 600 something students, mostly over the age of 65, who are used to coming into the, to the, our building for in-person courses, uh, in-person lessons, chamber music, that sort of thing. 
and we were going to have to go um, remotely. That was the only option we had. To put that into perspective, in Juilliard's over 100 year history, there have never been online classes at the school. So the evening division, I, we looked up one day and, and I realized that our division was going to have to be the first in over a century to bring remote learning uh, in a large scale way to Juilliard. So that was a sort of a looming over um, my team as we began to do this. And so we looked at some of the competing imperatives. We haven't had time. You know, James was just mentioning how quickly they had to transition their online convening or their convening to online. And um, we were actually on our spring break at the time. So we had about seven days to get uh, all 80 of those classes um, converted to online. So so the imperatives we had were um, not only time, but also looking at the techno technological um, skills of our faculty and also of our students and thinking through how are we going to find an inclusive structure for them. We also had issues around the platform and, and what platforms were the best suited for our group because there's a lot of inherent ageism in technological design where it, there, there's many assumptions about uh, what it, how you use something and it's built on the premise that a lot of people use technology frequently, but there are a lot of members of our uh, population who don't use maybe more than email on a day to day basis. So, um, so the thing, so a lot of learning management software that's designed for, if you may be familiar with like a canvas or a blackboard or something like that, that's actually not very inherent, uh, very apparent how it works for people who maybe don't use technology on a regular basis. So we had these things that we were kind of, we decided we would just list them and think through and rank, you know, what are the barriers from the strongest, um, the biggest barrier to sort of the, the most easily to over, overcome. Then the next kind of portion of this pinwheel was we needed to create a vision for online learning um, that was appropriate. So when I say appropriate, you have to think through, can the experience still be viable and fulfilling? And I wanna think uh, just about that for a moment because um, there's, as we kind of go into this new age of, uh, and I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but as we go into this new age there, it, and we had this push to really get things up and running so quickly, there was this like push to just get stuff up and get it going. Um, and what we ended up in many cases creating is thinking, well, it's how do we do what we do in, in a classroom or live online? And so it became for many people a goal of, you know, let's just, let's just do, let's just film whatever we were going to do in the classroom, put it online. And so I actually say, uh, I chose the word appropriate very carefully there because I want to find a way to create experiences that are fulfilling, that are appropriate to the medium that are appropriate to the age group, um, to the student body itself. Um, so it was thinking about designing to the needs uh, of the moment at that time. And then the next piece of this pinwheel was we could have a, a we had agreed upon Zoom as our medium. We had you know started ushering faculty to reformat and think through some of the parameters of what they were going to do in their class and how we were, they were going to transition that to online. And we were putting all this effort into it, but it also was very apparent to us that a really clear communication plan with our learning community in mind was really important and uh, making sure that people understand what they're about to do. And I think that has a bigger implication for creating um, interactive experiences, not just online learning, but, but online concerts and online lectures and any number of things that we are trying to do in a digital space now, or even a hybrid version of digital and in-person. People need to understand what they're going to be doing, how they're going to experience this. Um, what we found is that the mystery is not appealing. And so people want to understand the space they're going to be in. Just as like if you sign up for a class somewhere, say you sign, you know, in the fall semester, you sign up for a class at your local community center or um, in our case, the Juilliard School, you understand that that means you're going to get on a bus or a train, you're going to go to 65th Street 
you're going to walk into the building, you might be in the lobby, and you're going to go sit in a classroom, and you understand there are going to be desks and chairs and a blackboard, sort of like what's in the background of this picture. And you understand what that experience is going to be like. But we can't also say to people, well, we're going to do this online thing now, and it's going to be great, just click here, without sort of socializing and telling them what we plan on doing. And there are inherent fears. Will it be too difficult? Will I feel foolish because I don't understand the technology? Will I make a fool of myself because I'll, you know, unmute myself and not know what to do and, and not know how to get it back and embarrass myself in front of other people? So we have to communicate what the plan is and have a clear expectation of what the experience will be. And then the last piece of my pinwheel uh, here is you can have a really, uh, you can think through all of the things you need to think through around what, um, what's driving your decision making. You can create a vision that has all the curriculum and all the content and all the bells and whistles you want to include. You can tell everybody about that plan, but if you don't go back on the fourth kind of part here of the pinwheel, which connects back to the beginning, if you don't find a number of ways for people to participate, you will have effectively created a giant wall between you and your audience or your students or you know, whoever your group is um, that they feel they can't um, uh, penetrate. And that's really something that is uh, ironic about online instruction is that you know, the internet is supposed to be our great connector. But if we don't really design for participation, it actually becomes another third wall um, between you and the people that you're, you're working with. So really ensuring that there's a plurality of ways for students um, to participate. So I look at it as sort of a cycle. Uh, and it's helpful to think of it that way. And it's, there's no, it's not linear. There's no start or finish to the process. Uh, for me, it's a constant reevaluation, a constant going through this cycle of what are the barriers now? How do we remove barriers? You know, how do we uh, adapt our vision to make sure that it's appropriate to those barriers as well as our goals for learning? How do we communicate those changes, what we're doing? And then how, you know, how is it playing out in reality? Are people participating? Is the satisfaction high? Are, are people engaged? And then that feedback goes back to, okay, that's a new uh, imperative and so on. So I think of it as a pinwheel and a cycle. Um, so opportunities for the future. So one of the things that I um, wanted to think about today, um, just and since I'm the last one today, I think it's a nice for, it's a nice segue into the conversation um, that we're going to have. But I read a really fantastic article that I wanted to share a few points from uh, here and. Um, Think through, think through together. So um, Doug McLennan, who uh, is Seattle-based, actually, James, I'm sure you know who he is. Uh, he, he's a very uh, prominent uh, arts blogger and critic, and uh, he runs Arts Journal. He, he uh, recently did a speech for the Opera America conference uh, called How Talk Technology is Shaping Opera, and it's on the Diacritical blog from May 18th, so you can find it um, there. And it was really groundbreaking because um, the, the global pandemic that we've experienced, um, one common theme we saw was many people talking about the impact of, of you know, COVID-19 and how it's really, it's devastating the arts economy and it's, it's devastating, uh, you know, in-person experiences. And I think one of the interesting things that, that um, he talks about that I think is relevant to this conversation today is that um, actually, the global pandemic has just laid bare some of the, for, the structural fragilities uh, in the arts uh, and, and already in our existence. Um, it has sh our structures for um, revenue, our structures for engagement, our content choices, the way we get feedback from our audiences to shape their experience. Um, it really just sort of hyper realized a lot of those flaws. And so now we're forced to address them. We, we couldn't um, avoid them any longer. So I think that's like one really important, really important thing. He has three kind of points from his article. So I'll give you the too long, didn't read version. But the first is, he says, you know, looking to the future, we have to make the most of the medium. So what is your medium? Is it Zoom? Is it a Google Classroom? Is it um, 
FaceTime? What, what is the medium you're, you're using? And he talks a lot about this idea that we, and I mentioned it earlier, that we cannot present a facsimile of what we were doing before the pandemic or our art and our teaching will only feel like an echo of what it was before. You have to design for the medium. We have to be creative with the way we use webinar formats uh, and polling and engaging students. And, and um, you know, I've seen uh, our drama students in the, in, at Juilliard doing incredible monologues and dialogue performances using this tiny uh, box uh, you know, that's created with their webcam and trying to find ways to connect through the materials that they have. And I think that's gonna push our teaching artists and our um, administration and our faculty and all the people um, that are involved in the creation of artistic experience to think outside of the box or the webcam for what it's worth. Um, another major thing that Doug talks about that I'm really thinking a lot about these days is that old economics won't work in a new era. Um, if your model is on ticket sales or revenue sales or donations uh, that are related to a physical space and th that we've had for centuries, really, at least two centuries, um, if people can't fill those spaces, if the New York Philharmonic can only fill uh, David Geffen Hall, which seats, I think, around 2,000 people, only can fill it with 600 socially distanced people, the economics of that will not work. So why would we go back? To a system that maybe is, wasn't working really before. I mean, we already knew that ticket sales weren't um, supporting our uh, arts nonprofits before this. So why would we go back to uh, a world where there's um, only one um, kind of revenue and one kind of model? We need hybrid digital and live models to sustain us uh, both economically and artistically. And those hybrid models really include this idea that um, going back to making the most of the medium, really thinking through the design for the screen and the camera and thinking through what new ways can uh, digital video and uh, you know, 4K recording and all those great kind of film uh, aspects extend the artistic experience that we're uh, having. And that's not just for performing arts, that could be for lectures or classrooms or interviews or anything else. Um, but we're going to need new models to sustain this economically and artistically. And then the last kind of major point here is that the rapid transition um, to online instruction or performances or whatever your area is, has caused us to look at these barriers and the friction that we face on a level um, that we have forgotten about in our in our in-person offerings. So what's the friction? This kind of goes back to the, the first part of my pinwheel, the barriers. What makes it difficult to experience the art? Is it a, uh, not understanding how to use the technology on the user end? Is it lots of ways to click to find things? Are we not being clear in our descriptions? Are we um, presenting things that the audio quality isn't great? All, any, what we find with um, our online threshold for uh, rejection is that it's much, much, um, easier to say, well, this is too difficult. I can't find it. I can't find what I'm looking for. And so we have been thrust into a world where that has uh, all of a sudden become a very high value for all of us who are creating uh, interesting, uh, interesting artistic experiences. And so when we go back to uh, hybrid models and we're going back into live person convenings, those pain points are going to be much more fresh. Why is it difficult to get a ticket to this event? Why is it difficult to do X, Y, and Z? Why can't I get up and take a break? Why can't um, I get a further explanation that I could just, while I'm watching the, this you know, opera, I could just go over here and Google and get a quick uh, response to the question I have about the plot. We're going to see those things happen in classrooms and you know, a variety of ways. And so I think we have to really think about removing all those pain points uh, as we go back in introducing you know, hybrid and, and digital models. So these are some of the things that I wanted to discuss today. Um, I'm going to end my screen share really quickly. So I'm, I really appreciate um, everything. And uh, I wanted to wrap up with that, just saying that um, these kinds of um, creative experiences, the sky's the limit now. And I think we should look at the experiences we have now is an opportunity to explore change uh, for the future. So 
thanks uh, everyone and uh, I think that's it for me. Great, thank you uh, John Morgan for um, that really detailed walkthrough of how you've been uh, transitioning and particularly um, you, you did for, forecast where we were going here with your questions looking forward to the future because you know a, a theme across all four of these presentations is this kind of live adaptation you were you know, you, you, were, you were sitting at home and you wanted to create a solution to a problem. Uh, your, your organization needing to engage people who uh, weren't there and having to transform and, and shift. And so uh, I think you've highlighted a, a bunch of the kind of lived experiences while uh, going through this process of change. And now that, you know, some of this, uh, there's some things that we're gonna wanna keep uh, there's things we're going to want to transform. There's things we're going to want to build on. There's things we might want to forget and 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 not move. But I really like kind of the the kind of teeing up the discussion here around those things with that. And so I'd like to echo that back to our four panelists at this point. And if you're an attendee, um, please go ahead and start uh, sharing questions um, either in the Q and A or in the chat room here. We'll be monitoring that. And after a a quick kind of moderated discussion, we'll open it up to everybody. But uh, I'd like to open it back up to the panel to talk, um, you know, now that you've had a chance to hear each, each person's perspective, you know, what really are those things that um, you see transforming and keeping from this moment that you want to bring forward into your future uh, programming uh, now that the world is shifting, the world is different, um, necessity has been the mother of invention, what's gonna, what are the key things that you want to keep within your um, within your practice to help transform your organization for the future? Well, I, I can start. Um, you know, I really, really enjoyed McClellan's point about uh, the, creating a new normal, creating a quote unquote new normal. And the, you know, going back to the way we previously earned revenue as not being the way we can earn revenue moving forward, um, virtual and in person. Um, I think that's been really, really important for us moving forward. You know, previously we've taught our programs in person, but we're seeing, we saw such great success when uh, we were teaching specifically our lit program online because there was somehow less distraction when the students are at home working in front of the device versus in the school building uh, with their colleagues and friends moving about and the work that they've produced shows that, that the one-on-one -on -one mentorship that can, can happen with a, a teacher artist and a, and a young person online is that much stronger than, than the full group classrooms. And this of course makes us, makes us think about reimagining education in general and how classrooms were too large to begin with given the differing needs and uh, capacities of the young people we were serving. So it's really just a time to, you know, as you said, put a reset button on education and say like, what works? How do we make this more equitable to reach more students and to, to uh, boost more student achievement and, and leave away the times of the past? Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting point there that uh, perhaps in our uh, traditional approaches to teaching or programming, we focus so much on what happened us as teachers in that live moment of working with our students that we didn't necessarily worry about what happened after for the yes. homework. And now during this online time, we've really had to purposely think through our students' experience when they're not face-to-face -face with us. Mm -hmm. And I do hope that that um, continues forward and, and inspires uh, other thoughts with that. Yeah, great. I actually want to jump in just really quickly and, and say, to, to tag on to that, I think what I'm, we're finding, especially while we're uh, inside is um, with my students is there's a desire for more content than they would normally have. So the kind of the, the, the there, there's just this hunger for more content. And I think, uh, you know, as, as we were saying earlier, you know, you've, you've gotten through all your Netflix and all of your, your junk food, you know, entertainment, you've gotten through all the, the, the stuff. So people are having this desire to want to engage um, uh, more. So one thing that I would like to keep, as we go through creative experience, uh, designing experiences in a new normal after, you know, we kind of move forward is um, the level of participation and input I'm getting from my students on the kinds of things they want to see and to program. I mean, we should be responding to that. So surveys and, and feedback and, and really just expanded communication, 
I think creates for a better dialogue for presenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious uh, whether, Flora, if you, if you have any thoughts about that as you've been, you're, the whole focus of your project has been uh, creating this forum for co-creating and, and maybe you have some ideas around or things you could share around surprises you've seen in terms of what people have been creating uh, on your platform and adding or, or, other, or other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Alex. So I was thinking like, uh, really, I think collab is like a silver lining of the COVID-19 situation uh, because we always want to do something like that, but we always have something more prioritized uh, because we usually have our projects offline. So things like this online, um, it's usually on the very low end of our priority. But because of the COVID-19, it's actually getting moved to the, to the very top. And I'm actually really grateful during the process of creating and maintaining a collab because we interact and we met a lot of like our contributors. They are coming from like a variety of backgrounds. Most of them are not actually in the field, in the circle of social innovation, but they just do it as their like side projects, as something they are really passionate about. So this is something really touched me and something I'm really excited to see uh, during the process. I think we would really like to maintain and to grow uh, CoLib not only because it's something we believe in and also because it's a community we really want to keep. And the people we are really enjoying uh, having their uh, company and we can see us being together, we can create something maybe uh, more special and something else other than co-lab. So the people is something really touch us. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, Lei, if you have anything to add. I mean, there's a common theme here around uh, your transgenerational design, whereas, you know, uh, some, you know, for instance, within arts core, it's primarily working with youth, but there's also professional development for teachers and, and working with that. I'm wondering if you have some, some additional thoughts uh, around that aspect in particular. I think even, even though I have uh, worked for Nanjing University as a lecturer for many years, so I guess I'm experienced teaching adult students and uh, I'm really a very unsuccessful teacher uh, in terms of uh, the in, in family because my son never, never uh, <laughs> really understand what I'm talking about. But I try so hard to teach him, teach him something, but somehow he just, uh, we just, we just, I just got a, uh, the difficulty to bonding with him. And and I actually have put some thoughts about that. So when I, when we talk about the transgender uh, teaching things, I think most importantly is um, for for some people is very is almost like um, intuitively they can absorb both online and offline. And we all know as a as an efficient learner, you have to uh, treat something. Uh, like it's, you, 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 you can, you can, uh, you can find on online, but uh, we know if we can uh, use an offline interaction more effectively, that will uh, make uh, make it. It's more like detox. I was treating the, the online things as like um, the poisonous because the. Uh, we, without this pandemic thing, I would never thought about doing this online education things. But because because of the quarantine and people cannot uh, join my teaching compound, uh, I sort of I I have to do some online recording. But when I record almost like thirty hours nonstop together with my colleague, I find some uh, pedagogical things that actually quite interesting by using online interaction. Um, so I guess I, I quite agree with uh, one of our uh, panelists said uh, in for this time around you, you have to invent your own media and but for me the media always be I using people as as a media so many things you have to to do is in is face-to-face -face interaction um, but some something probably we can 
contribute by using it, uh, the internet as a, as, a, as a mediation. I guess that's, that's why this morning I read an article is actually tweeted by um, a professor, a Chinese specialist, uh, worked for Duke University, is that even Silicon Valley is not a starter of this uh, COVID-19, uh, but Silicon Valley profited from this, from this pandemic. We need, we need to be cautious about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Yanyue, I believe you had a question you wanted to ask him. Um, yeah, that got me thinking, uh, just hearing what Lei was saying about um, our sense of time has also changed a lot um, when we change to different medium. And uh, I've been following a lot of the online events by um, NGOs and organizations. And I found relatively uh, three types of thinking. Uh, one is like our panelists today, we are acting and trying to adapt very quickly. And we are reflecting on that and we're being trying to be open and transparent because we know not everything is perfect, right? And then um, there's the other extreme uh, where I notice a lot of public organizations, they just want to tick the box um, because they receive public funding and they just say, oh, we've just moved everything online now that um, we've completed our responsibility. Um, and then there's the other um, kind of in the middle-ish um, with perhaps a lot of organizations that are having big challenges because they, they just don't know, they, they get lost. Um, it sometimes happens to us as well. They just caught in between. They don't even know um, what this, how they are going to deal with these challenges, not just pedagogically, but like we've heard with uh, how to deal with the employees, how to keep the founding going, it's like massive challenges altogether. So I'm wondering whether uh, in all of your experience, um, how do you deal with this? And what would you say to, to the other organizations that are struggling? I'll, I'll jump in uh, for a first response to that is, um, I think that a clear line of communication to all of these stakeholders is really important. You need to let your employees know what's going on and, and talk about what the options are. You need to comfort your audiences or your, the people who you're working with or your learning community, whoever it is that you serve, they need to understand what's going on with you and you know doubt creates fear and so i think the first step regardless of what the actual situation is is to really communicate uh, and open that door because ideas can flourish and problem solving can flourish when people are talking yeah i would i would add add to that um you know trans you know transparency as john morgan said is so so key uh in in everything and values are where you put your budget you know if if you're worried about your bottom line what are you centered on what's your value and that will guide you uh, and if it's it's centered on the people that you're serving uh, you will have better outcomes well, not better outcomes but you will have outcomes that you you'll be more satisfied with <laughs> great uh, are there any other questions from the uh, audience and attendees um, feel free to put them in the, uh, in the chat and we'll ask them. And then uh, uh, also if uh, any of our panelists have other thoughts that you'd like to share at this point, um, ideas that came up or, or ideas in your mind that you want to follow up on. We have uh, two questions in our Q&A. Uh, first question from Andri Andrina. How are you evaluating your decision-making process? And if you are, are you able to make changes on the way? I know ArtScore has an external evaluator uh, to help us, help guide us. And we have made changes on the way um, because we're, we're adapting as things are adapting so quickly. Uh, we're constantly making changes. What's, what we've been trying to do and trying to hold true is to stay true to our mission. If, we can, if it aligns with our mission and that change makes sense, we will do it. But if it doesn't align with our mission and that change um, leads to mission drift, we will try to uh, step away from that. But you know, the evaluative process involves both the, the young people we're working with, their families, and the schools. 
And then of course, uh, the external evaluator determines the most efficacious way to move forward for us. Yeah, I would, I would jump in just to, as a quick follow-up to that is, um, you know, I think a group of people as an advisory board, whether that's an official capacity or unofficial capacity as a task force, um, what, I've, what I've seen is really thinking through a few trusted advisors to help on various issues um, that need to be dealt with. So a group of people who will deal with technology uh, readiness, a group of people who can talk about curricular adaptations, right? Go through your whole net network or through the organization and, and pull in, you know, your parents, your faculty, your students, and put, put them together and see what comes out of that. Because I think if you have a brain trust, you can make good decisions. Yeah, uh, I wonder whether Flora or Ney have comments because you have a lot of projects. Maybe you're doing a lot of self-evaluation instead of external evaluation. So yeah, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I will touch base on the question. So about like making change on the way, actually we do that very often. Uh, the first thing is because we are at the very early stage of being a social enterprise. So we always have to like adapt ourselves to the, to the needs, to the changing needs, or maybe we understand better the needs of our clients. So we make change. And so I think the, the first qu quarter of the year, yeah, because of the pandemic, and we try a lot of different things, especially, I mean, technology wise. So we try different like online learning platform. It's just blooming. I mean, booming, yeah. Um, because people are stuck at home and they have to use, kind of rely on those online uh, education platform to get the information. And we also try the live stream. I think anyone who, who are in China can understand how we're surrounded by like live streaming to help you with the shopping and help you with a lot of things like like the TikTok and something like that. So we never tried that before, but we kind of are forced and we also want to try it. And I think this is the, 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 the changing atmosphere. As an organization, we publish annual reports. Uh, it's not just the academic report, but also we have some uh, uh, like a philanthropic project going on. So we want to make it transparent. So uh, many budget plan, also fundraising plan is all, is all open to the public. That's the one thing we've been doing. But the most important things uh, we as organization are trying to do is to invite people to come in to our center um, to make it, this center um, uh, more uh, accessible, not just for our potential partners, but also for some community members. And we even organized some uh, small tools for old people if they're interested about the uh, transgeneration uh, uh, design. And also we invite some primary school stu uh, students and teachers. So that, that's something we were doing to keep our ourselves uh, constantly um, uh, doing something that uh, we have been we have written down and um, on the front page of our website just keep keep us uh, sober uh, in order to to keep the all at the same time keep the momentum mm -hmm. thank you uh flora do you want to finish your part sure sorry about that i don't know why the internet uh, connection is really poor. So I was just saying, yeah, we tried like uh, a variety of like the technology, the platform thing. I think it's a good try because we told other people to go beyond their comfort zone, but sometimes we stay in our comfort zone. And I think because of the pandemic, it's a, it's a unfortunate situation, but uh, we can, I think everyone can take advantage of it to push themselves to get out of the comfort zone. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to uh, one last question quickly 
from Eric, who uh, is asking if anyone can comment on organizational changes, linking that back to uh, the change in economics that John Morgan brought up. Uh, and also a question to James from Eric is more about the art kits. Uh, how did students use them? Were they posting things to TikTok? Um, they remind me of kits that parents buy for young kids uh, to get them into science, like Kiwi kits. I wonder what it takes to get older students to engage with these materials. I'll start with the, the art kits. Uh, yeah, the, the, the funny thing is, we are trying to figure out how those families are using the art kits because so few of them have access to technology to a TikTok, uh, to create a TikTok. So our external evaluator, which uh, I mentioned earlier, is doing, is doing uh, phone calls and, and in-person visits to these community sites just to say, is anyone interested in, in emailing or, I mean, talking to me on the phone about what their young people are doing? Um, but I do know that from the teacher artists that have gone to these sites, they are taking photos and they've made um, different montages and, and visual arts projects based on just their creative expression of where they are right now. You know, I find that, that art is the best way to do that. And one of the, the most uh, essential ways for, for especially young people to say, I don't know what I'm feeling right now, but I will draw something. I don't know what I'm feeling right now, but I will make some music. I don't know how to say this, but I'm going to hum it. Um, and that's, that's been really interesting to, to watch and, and to, to take a part in. One of the young people that did have technology uh, made a video about her cat, which was uh, just like a documentary and Planet Earth style video about her cat and how much her cat has influenced and helped her during this quarantine. So that, that, that's, that's, that was pretty amazing to watch. Great, and uh, another question here, uh, I think John Morgan, you wanted to answer this, which is what solutions have been found in terms of assessment for these creative projects? And I know, James, you talked a little bit about having the evaluator give input onto that, but particularly in the virtual environment, how, how are you thinking about that? Well, I think one of the benefits of so much digital uh, engagement is we have all kinds of built-in metrics so we can you know, check, we can, for the first time we can uh, really look closely at click-through rates, uh, you know, length of time view. I've been watching how many participants in this in this uh, webinar today. So I'm just constantly looking at and measuring turnout uh, for various events and measuring engagement levels in a way that um, we used to say, oh, it's, the room looked really full, you know, and now we can kind of really more closely watch uh, some, some of these tools we had before, um, but we just weren't paying as close of attention. So I'm watching those things. I'm also, uh, inviting back to this idea of multiple ways for people to participate really inviting people to do a quick survey a quick uh submit you know your thoughts do you have ideas for making it better next time you know really giving people a chance to be a part of the creative process in whatever way that they can and uh we've actually gotten some really great ideas from that so um, i think that's really important too is uh, measuring success uh you have to ask the people you're serving so um i think a good old-fashioned survey is really important. I see James, you're shaking your head up and down. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Talk to the people. Talk to the people, right. Right. Great. And uh, with that, I think is a good, uh, a good uh, point to bring everybody together. Uh, it's been such a strong theme across all four presentations about listening to your participants, who you're serving, your stakeholders, um, and just being close and keeping them front and center of, of whatever you're doing, whether you're designing a new tool for uh, creation or it's your educational programming or your outreach work, uh, to continue to listen and track and to ask, you know, how's it going? Uh, what's working? Uh, and then be keeping your minds and eyes open for these new opportunities to rethink the way you're teaching, different ways of reaching them, uh, etc. So it's been a pleasure to have all four of you and thank you to our attendees for your questions. Uh, as uh, we said before, the uh, sessions will be recorded and posted on both our YouTube channel 
and also uh, soon on Billy Billy, uh, both with uh, translations in uh, Chinese and English as we continue our international uh, discussions here around creative learning. So um, thank you all very much for your time and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. <laughs>